All right, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, this is an OPA deep dive, the open policy agent. So I wanted to first get a sense of what everybody knows about OPA. So who here knows what OPA is? Okay, good. Uh, just about everybody. Perfect. Uh, how many people stopped by our booth? And okay, and how many people went to Torin's intro to OPA? Okay, so probably most people, about half, have seen the demo. So today what we're going to focus on is uh, sort of the language introduction. So going deeper into the language, we touched on that at the demo at the booth. Torin touched on it at, the, at his presentation yesterday. So we're just going to spend the whole time today talking about uh, writing policy and how you do that with OPA. Why? Because that's the thing that you'll do uh, most often, right? Um, and so well, that's what we're going to go through today. My name's Tim Henricks. I'm one of the maintainers of OPA. Um, Torin has been very busy this week, uh, so we decided to have me go ahead and give this talk. I've built a number of these policy systems over the last 15 years. That's what I do. Um, and so, uh, and, and more importantly, I guess, I've been using OPA for maybe writing policy 10 hours a week for the last, I don't know how many months. Um, so I do this fairly frequently, all right? So, and I'd like this to be pretty inter interactive. So we've got a microphone, he a microphone here, which makes it a little bit more awkward, but, but go ahead and ask questions throughout. Um, uh, and, 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 and please make this uh, uh, fun for everybody, okay? Of course, he goes to sleep. All right, um, so I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same page here and give you this brief overview of OPA, right? The goal of OPA is, or, or at least what OPA is, is a, is a domain agnostic, a general purpose policy system, right? What that means is that you can use OPA to solve policy and authorization problems at any layer of your software stack, right? And here are some examples of the kinds of integrations that we've done with OPA. Uh, we've done integrations with Kubernetes to do admission control, uh, with Linux to allow you to control who can SSH into a server or who can run pseudo commands, with Docker to allow you to control what kinds of containers people can run, uh, with Terraform to control uh, what changes someone could make to, for example, a public cloud. You can use OPA to express policy and authorization over microservice APIs, right? Every time a microservice receives an API call, uh, is that authorized or not? And that's what Netflix has used OPA for. Um, all right, so that's the goal of OPA. The goal of OPA is sort of this realization that we're doing policy and authorization in all these different layers of the stack today, but the problem is that we're using different mechanisms to enforce those authorization policies. What OPA aims to do is provide a single way, a single language for expressing policy at all these different enforcement points, a single tool set, a single user experience. Right? So that's the overall goal of OPA. Um, when you go to use OPA to policy enable a project or service, and that's its goal, right? Its goal is to make it very easy to add rich, fine-grained, context-aware policy to an existing project or service. So when you go to do that, there are three steps, three conceptual things that you're going to want to think about. The first of which is how do you integrate OPA with that external project? How do you integrate OPA with Kubernetes or with Linux or with Terraform? The second thing that you're going to do is author policy, and that's what we're going to spend most of the time here today talking about. Um, and then after that, you're going to think about managing OPA, which is a whole bunch of stuff around how do you deploy it, how do you, how do you uh, uh, retrieve policies, audit decisions, monitor health. We're not going to touch on that at all today. Um, uh, what we are going to do is touch a little bit on how you integrate, because integration and understanding how OPA interacts with each of these systems, with each of these enforcement points, is actually pretty important for understanding how you write policy. All right? And then we're going to go and spend most of the time talking about the policy language uh, and, and what it provides for you. All right. So after we talk a bit about how policies are invoked by that external system, once you've done an integration, then we'll talk, we've sort of broken this up into different kinds of policies. Um, and so I don't know if we'll get through all of this today, but these are slides, we'll make them available. Uh, this is sort of our, our training deck uh, on the OPA language. OK, so how are policies invoked? How does the system uh, work once it's been integrated with OPA? OK, so the service up above is whatever we were talking about, Kubernetes or Linux or, or whatever. Um, and then every time that that service needs an authorization or a policy decision, it's going to ask OPA uh, um, for that decision. And the way it does that is that OPA is, has an HTTP server uh, built into it. And, and the reason for that is that uh, conceptually, architecturally, what we want to have happen is that OPA is running on the same server as the service that you're integrating with. And the reason that's important is because we want to guarantee that for authorization and policy decisions, that um, that service can always get policy decisions in a highly performant, highly available way. Right? Authorization is one of those key functionalities where if suddenly you cannot get authorization decisions, that service up there becomes a brick. Right? It does not know what to do. 
So we need to ensure that the service has highly available and highly performant authorization and policy decisions. And for that, we ensure OPA runs on the same server as the service, right? No worry about network partitions or network latency, all right? Now, uh, at the same time, that OPA exposes an HTTP uh, server so that when the service over localhost hits the HTTP server in, in OPA, uh, the way it does that is that uh, when that service asks for a decision, it does a single HTTP post, all right? And that single HTTP post requires that you provide a policy name, which is part of the URL, and then the service provides a bunch of input. Uh, and that input represents whatever the service knows uh, that, that it needs a decision about. And, and we're going to go through an example in just a moment. But the important thing to realize here is that when that service provides input to OPA, the input is always JSON. And what I mean here is that it is arbitrary JSON. It is an arbitrary JSON object. OPA does not know or care what that object that it's sent represents. When OPA, once OPA makes a decision, and it makes that decision using logic, which is the rego is policy and, and external data, then it returns a 200 and, and sends the result back to the service. Now, the important thing to keep in mind here is that the input is JSON that we send to OPA, and the output is JSON that OPA sends back. And that's important not because of serialization, but because conceptually, OPA only re requires that the input and the output be JSON, and that's why it works for any domain on the planet. That's why it works for all of those systems that we saw earlier. Um, uh, one other important point here is that policy decisions are arbitrary JSON, which means that they're not simply true-false answers, right? They're not simply authorization answers. They can be answers that return, let's say, a host name, which is a string, or a rate limit, which is a number, or an array, which is maybe the clusters that you'd like to deploy a workload to, or a dictionary. Maybe that's a JSON patch that you'd like to apply to a Kubernetes pod before it's released into the wild. Right? So OPA is a general purpose policy system, which means it works for any domain. And also, it, uh, it returns policy decisions that are more than simply Boolean true-false answers. All right, here's an example to, drive this, to, to make sure this is super clear. All right, this is an example drawn from the HTTP API authorization space. Right? So imagine we've got a microservice, and every time that microservice receives an API call, it checks with OPA to see whether it's authorized or not. In order for that to happen, the, the request that the service sends to OPA is a post at, as you can see there, HTTP auth z allow. That HTTP auth z is, is the policy name, effectively. Um, and then the input that it provides is an encoding in JSON of the API that that microservice wants an authorization decision about. Right? So in this case, there's a method, there's a path, and there's a user, right? which is sort of an obvious encoding of an API. Uh, then uh, there's a policy inside of OPA that makes a decision as to whether or not this API call is authorized. In this case, uh, uh, what we see is that there's a package called http.authz, and that corresponds exactly to the first part of that policy name in the URL there in orange. Um, and then what we're going to do is here, we're going to say that, um, this, that we're gonna, uh, this policy actually says that every uh, API is authorized as long as the input, as long as the user is Bob. All right, so there's some policy like that. This is a super simple one. We're going to go into more detail about how you write these. Um, and then what, uh, what OPA returns is just result is true, right? This, this request is allowed. Yes? Yeah, good question. So the question was, can OPA reach out in the outside world and get additional information that it may need in order to make a decision? Uh, what you see over there on the right-hand side is there's that data s segment. All right, so OPA does have an API that allows you to inject arbitrary data into OPA. The idea there being that you sort of pre-cache all of the requests that you might make to an external service inside of OPA. Right? So that's one way that OPA gets additional information beyond what's put into the input. Um, another way that is common, especially in this microservice API case, is that people will, when they handle authentication, they will put uh, external information, like that would come out of LDAP or AD, into a JOT token and then hand that jock token to OPA as part of the input. And so that's another common way that people will get external information that you need to make policy decisions into OPA. There's a third mechanism, which is very new, and we're not recommending anybody use it yet. Um, but there is this functionality in OPA that we're trying out, which during policy evaluation, it, you can go out and, and hit an external database or HTTP server. Yeah, good question. OK, so any, other, any questions about invoking policy? All right, so, so sorry, one thing I'll drive home here is that this input in this example has a method, path, and user. That is the right thing to do, let's say, for HTTP API authorization. But OPA does not know or care what any of those fields mean, the method, the path, or the user. It does not care at all. If this were SSH, 
uh, maybe the input would be a user and some other metadata about the server, right? Which, re which region is it in? Is it for prod, et cetera? If this were a Kubernetes example, then the input that you'd give to OPA would be like a, um, a, a user, maybe the API that that user's calling, like create pod, and then another field, which is like the, the YAML description of that pod that we've all seen and, and know and love uh, from Kubernetes. Okay, so OPA does not know or care what that input is, and that's why it works for any domain. Okay, we had a question here. Yes, no, it does, not, it does not store mutable state. OPA is entirely stateless. Well, it's not entirely stateless. The decisions it makes are entirely based on the state that it has. Um, you could, like, from outside go and, like, uh, after the service gets a decision, it could push new state into OPA through that JSON. Uh, we've, not rec we've not recommended that. Another question. Yeah, our question is, can we com uh, secure communication between service and OPA? Yes, uh, mutual TLS. Anything else? OK, good. All right. So uh, first kind of policies we're going to look at, we're calling simple here, uh, lack of a better term. Um, and, and the idea here is that any, uh, when you're writing policy, the first thing you think about is what is the input that's coming into this policy in order for me to make a decision, right? And so in this example, we've shown uh, microservice APIs. Uh, and this was exactly the same example we just talked through. Now, the first thing that you need to do in order to, to sort of make a decision about this particular input is what? Well, you have, to need, you have to be able to look up the values that showed up in the input, right? So you may need to look up, well, the, the, what is the method, what is the user, what is the path? And if you see there on the right-hand side, that's how you do it. You do it in the obvious way. Input here is a keyword in OPA, and it, what it does is it's the root of that JSON document that was handed into OPA as input. Um, and now once you can look up different values, you need to be able to compare them. So input method equals get is doing the obvious thing. Input.path of zero, that's referencing the first array element inside of the path field uh, that we're given as input. Um, and then input.user does not equal input.method is doing what you would expect. We've got 50 operators uh, that go beyond simple equality checks inside of OPA. And what I'm doing when I'm writing policy day in and day out is I usually have that open in a tab in my browser. All right. OPA also lets you assign variables, as you might expect. You have common logic, uh, and, and, and so using those kind of intermediate temporary variables is valuable. Um, here, path colon equals input dot path is doing the obvious thing. It's, it's creating a new variable called path, and it's assigning it the value of input dot path. Once you have those intermediate variables, it is just a variable that holds a JSON object, and you can use that variable just like any other JSON object. You can dereference it with array indexes, uh, dot into it, uh, like a dictionary, and so on and so forth. Uh, when you start looking at the documentation, one of the things that we'll say, we'll start using terms like um, uh, a head and a body, so uh, of a rule, right? So a rule here is just a, an assertion, a statement that makes a policy decision. So in this rule, we're just saying that allow is true exactly when the input method is a get and the input user is Bob, all right? Now, the, 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 the rule, or the, sorry, every rule has a head and a body, and you'll see that in the docs. Uh, and so here, the, the first part of it is the rule head, allow equals true. Um, the name of the rule here is allow, and the value is true. Uh, one thing that we do is that uh, there is a default or implicit uh, assumption that if you do not tell us what the type of the variable is, what the value is that you're assigning it in the head, uh, then, then uh, by default you're saying that that should be true. And that's why we can write these simple allow statements that you saw before. Uh, the rule body is everything inside those curly braces. Um, and then all of the statements inside the rule body are anded together. All right, uh, I think that's here. Yes, they're anded together. If you want an or, oh, sorry, in, in this statement, what we're saying is that allow is true if input.method is, is get and the, uh, and the user requesting, making the API request is Bob. If you want to have an or, then you write multiple statements, right? Um, this is what you would expect. Uh, you can use the same rule head multiple times, uh, just like uh, you would expect for s a simple allow and deny rules language. And, um, and then there's a question here, which is, well, suppose you've got 10 or 100 or 1,000 of these allow statements. What happens if none of them apply? What is the value of allow in that case? And by default, allow or any other variable is undefined if, it, if none of the rules apply to it. Uh, now, of course, that's not always what you want. Um, and so there is a, a keyword here uh, within OPA that allows you to specify what the default value of any of these variables is. And that is uh, here. Here we have an example where we say default of allow equals false. Syntax is what you might expect. You just stick a default in in on the front of an assignment. 
All right, you can only use one default per, uh, per rule, uh, and OPA will complain and tell you if you've made, that, made a mistake there. All right. The, one of the common things that, that people ask is, well, I, you know, this is, I'm used to writing programs all the time. I'm used to writing functions to, to factor out common logic. So can OPA do that? The answer is yes. Um, so let's look at a slightly different input. This time, uh, path is represented as a string here instead of an array as we had previously. Uh, and that's sort of the, the thing that you might expect out of the gate. Um, and now we have a rule. And when we write this rule to, to encode the same logic that we had before, we need to do some string manipulation to actually parse that URL uh, and, and pull out the components of it to do whatever checking that we need to do. Okay? And so what you see here is that this, the, what's in this box is just some very common string manipulation. And if you had 10, uh, 10 different allow statements, you'd have to repeat that string manipulation logic in each and every one of those rules. Well. Obviously, OPA has accounted for this. And in the language, what you, we allow you to do is create a function. And this is a function that means basically the same thing as any function in, in any programming language. Here, split path is a function that we've defined that just encapsulates that common logic. Um, yeah. Now, functions actually turn out to simply be rules that take arguments. All right, so all the same things that I said about rules a moment ago apply to functions as well. You can use the same function name in multiple rules, as you see up here. Um, and the only real restriction here is that when you do an evaluation, there's only one answer that ever comes out of a function, right? as you would expect. Um, yeah. So the question here is, what is, uh, what is the semantics in terms of ordering? So does it just evaluate top to bottom in terms of the rules? Does it stop once it's found one? Uh, what happens there? So uh, uh, with OPA, order, uh, the order in which you write statements is completely irrelevant. So you can write them in any order, and the meaning of, the, 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 the language, the meaning of your policy remains the same. There are constructs that if you want to uh, have ordering put in place, then you can, in fact, do that. So we don't cover that here. But there's an else keyword that allows you to simply chain things together. Um, and, and so you can do that kind of thing. Uh, uh, yes, another question. What's that? Oh, regular expressions, yeah. So uh, one of those or one or two of the operators that we have in, the, in that list of 50 uh, handles regular expressions, yes. Yes. Is, is there a common way to share logic like, like this, like, like those common simple metrics across uh, OPA deployments in, in, in this case? Across OPA deployments. So if, if, if you have an OPA agent for corp X and then for corp Y. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was is there an easy way to share? common functions across different OPA deployments. Uh, one of the things we'll see a little later is that uh, OPA does allow you to create multiple policies. And then you can import one policy from another, just like you would in Python or any programming language. Um, and so uh, that would allow you to share a, a common function, let's say, across multiple policies for sure. Now, in terms of sharing it across multiple OPA like deployments, you would have to, to replicate the policies there. OK. Uh, oh, yeah, OK. I forgot to mention here. Uh, so this equals true trick where you don't have to write equals true is the same for functions as it is for rules. Uh, great. OK. So enough for functions. Uh, one of the things that I already mentioned, because it came up in a question, is that one of the cool things about OPA is that you can use external context information about what's going on in the world in order to make policy decisions. Uh, so, for, um, so for Kubernetes, the, the integration that we did, this is incredibly valuable, and we use this. Uh, for example, what we do when, uh, with Kubernetes is we load into OPA all of the information, all the metadata about the pods and all the namespaces that exist. And so when you're making an, an admission control decision within OPA, you can use all the information about what the other pods are in order to make an authorization or an admission control decision. So for example, if you wanted to say in OPA that um, in every namespace, there can be at most one po pod called default, then you can do that. But obviously, you can't do that if you don't have all the information about what the other pods and all the other namespaces actually are. So when we do the integration with OPA, we are injecting into OPA um, all the information from Kub that Kubernetes has about the other pods. The way that you do that is that you run, again, it's a very simple one-liner HTTP call uh, where you put 
at a particular path. Again, it's sort of the name that you'd like to associate with this data. Uh, and then the, at the body of the put is simply the JSON uh, object that you want to be there. Right? So super simple to load any, any kind of context on the planet. And this is incredibly powerful because it means that, like, again, you can use data about Kubernetes, or you can use data about a calendar, you can use data about anything on the planet to, to make policy decisions. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how do you keep it in sync? And the answer is, that has to happen outside of OPA. Right? OPA allows you to inject it. And so then um, it depends a bit on what system you're integrating with, how you, how you keep that up to date. Right? So like AD, for example, has a way you can, you can listen to deltas, and then you could push those into OPA. Uh, Kuber, uh, Kubernetes has a similar thing, and uh, you can set up a watch to get a stream of updates, and then you can keep, keep OPA up to date that way. But that is a, a code that is specific to the integration that you're doing, and so that, that just has to live outside of OPA. Yeah. Yes? So that's really limited by your by memory, right? There's no OPA doesn't really know or care. Obviously, if you start trying to shove a terabyte of data into OPA, uh, you should think real hard about whether that's a that's a good idea. Uh, all of the policies and data in OPA are stored in memory, and so and that's a you know a design decision that, that that we made because for us OPA is really this host local cache to ensure that the service that needs authorization decisions can get them very quickly, um, and so we just put put all that in memory. Um, yeah. What was the first part? Uh, if there are means of people, oh, pre-processing. Well, again, the thing that's, yeah, so the question is, uh, can you pre-process data before you push it into OPA? One of the goals of OPA is to allow you to push just any arbitrary raw JSON in so that you can make authorization decisions about that, using that data. Uh, and so we don't require anything other than it's got to be JSON. So if you want to do pre-processing, then, um, then you would do that outside of OPA and then and push it in in, in JSON. Uh, one of the things that you'll see in the language, if I, I, I may not remember to hit on this again, but one of the things you can do in the language is, do, uh, is introduce sort of um, virtual JSON documents that allow you to sort of say, well, look, the data that comes in is not in a great form for me to write policy over. And so what you can do is sort of insert a layer, these virtual uh, documents, between the raw data that comes in and the policies that you'd actually like to write. And in so doing, you can do a little bit of that ETL. Yeah, in the back. Yes, so uh, like you're talking about, oh, sorry, the question was, have we thought about adding documentation functionality so that somebody who doesn't know the internals of, of the policy can have some ideas to what its, what its semantics are? Um, so yeah, so this is something on the list where, yeah, it'd be great if we had, you know, some like Java doc kind of functionality where as you write policy, you annotate the policy and then the, the, the tool will spit out nice docs for that. So yeah, that's just on the list, haven't done it. We love contributions, so if you have ideas, uh, yeah. I wondered if part of the decision was made, okay, an explanation of what was policy Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, I'm not going to demo it here. We didn't de demo it yesterday, but there is functionality inside of OPA to say, give me a, a trace of the decision that you made. Um, and then we even, for a while, tried to go and, and sort of prune that trace down to like the minimal that you actually needed to understand why the, 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 the decision was made the way it was. Um, but that's in there. Uh, it again, it needs some work. So if you're, uh, uh, we'd love to help. Yes? Is it possible to merge data that goes into the, into the OPA? Because put would just be like to override the right? So yeah, the uh, question was, can you, um, can you merge data uh, when you send it into OPA? So there is a JSON patch. So you can use that to, to just push deltas in. Um, and then, again, in the policy language, if you were trying to actually merge data, like you had you know, users from AD and users from LDAP, and you wanted all users, then you can express that idea within the policy language using a virtual document, and then write your policy on top of that, that virtual document. Yeah? OK. Wow, lots of questions. Good. All right. 
is there a question is, is there a way to index the data? So yes, um, index the, the data itself. Uh, we did have that for a while. I think we've removed it recently. We just need to put it back in. Um, but yes, uh, in terms of performance, there is this question once you start shoving arbitrary JSON in there, you do want to make sure that it's going to perform at the, uh, the way you want. And there are some just basic tricks. When we've worked with people in the past, what we've said is like, look, just use a dictionary to do you know, constant time lookup uh, so that we're not doing linear scans of like arrays. And that has typically been enough. Um, but yes, there is indexing, like reverse indexing, doing static analysis over the policies to figure out what indexes are appropriate and then building those lazily over during evaluation. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, can you enforce schema on the data coming in during policy evaluation? And again, this is another one on our wish list, so please uh, uh, help us out. Um, not today. Uh, one of the observations that we've made, though, is that from the services point of view, if, uh, even assuming that w or once we have this sort of schema checking in place uh, on the inputs, then you know, imagine the service gives OPA some bad data. It still needs an authorization decision, right? Like, we can't forget that that thing assumes that it's going to get a decision back. So once we have the schema checking in there, we can get an error, and then it's like, what does it do, right? I don't know. Um, and so, but yes, schema checking is something that we're going to do. The one thing that we do do today is we do type inference uh, over all of the policy that exists. And so, as, uh, um, and so, you know, it'll figure out things like, well, you're referencing a field that doesn't exist, or you're using a string w when it's really a number. Um, and so we do that kind of thing. So all we need to do is now add the schema declarations for the inputs and the, the, uh, what we call the base documents, which is this data over here that we're injecting. Um, and then we'll be able to do full analysis over everything. Yeah. Uh, the question is, if there's an, an error on one of the rules, how, how does that get returned to the sender? So there are different cases, right? Like, so OPA is pretty forgiving in the language itself. So if you like dot into a dictionary and that dictionary doesn't have that field, it'll just go ahead and say, well, that's undefined. Like that, that particular rule is undefined. And so then it'll continue evaluation because there may very well be another rule that, that permits or denies that request. Uh, so one of the so you so the return values that you can get out of OPA are effectively uh, of a JSON value. You can get undefined, and then uh, and then you can get an error. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me give you a quick example of how you use context once you've injected it into OPA. Here the idea is that now on the left hand side, in, in addition to input, we also have this data. Um, and, and, we're, and I'm using the term data because data is another keyword inside of OPA. So if you're trying to reference the information that comes in as part of the input, you use the keyword input. If you're trying to reference information that's been injected via context, you use the keyword data. So over here on the right-hand side, what you see is that the first allow statement is just using input. The second allow statement, and, and what that's saying is that users can access their own salary. So here we're just doing a check over inputs. The second statement is saying that um, HR can access any salary. And, and the reason that's important is because HR is like who is a member of HR is not information that comes in with the API call, right? It's just not there. And so you need that external context in order to make a decision. And so for that, the way we do that is we just, uh, here we're assigning user a, a temporary variable, and we're looking up inside the data.users dictionary, which is the, the, the bit over here on the left. Uh, we're indexing into this dictionary uh, whatever the input.user value actually is. And so then the, the, the user variable here is a JSON object, which includes one of these, uh, one of these dictionaries here uh, that have the department inside. And so then when we say user.department equals HR, whoops, that's doing what you would expect. All right, so whether the, the data comes in from input or comes in as data, uh, you, sort of, you have different roots, but all the operations are exactly the same. Remember, oh, sorry, the question was, uh, it looks like the first rule returns true, the second rule returns false. Remember that the semantics here is that um, the, the rule only returns true if the body holds. If the body is true, then the head becomes true. So the first rule, let's say it evaluates to true. The second rule does not evaluate to false, it evaluates to nothing, undefined. And then we or those two together and we get true. So, yeah. Yes? 
Yeah. Uh, so, th so if, uh, oh, sorry, the question was, what happens if the rules give you conflicting results? So what you could do here, so to make this case, you could say allow equals true if the first one, allow equals false if the second one, right? Let's just say, it wouldn't encode what we said here, but imagine that that was the kind of rule that we had. So one thing that we do is we say, we, we recommend not doing that, um, unless you absolutely have to. Uh, but in that case, if you got a, an actual conflict, we would say that's an error. Now, what you could do, and what maybe you're thinking of, is what people often will do is they'll write allow rules and deny rules. You can do that here. But then what you need to do is OPA doesn't know about allow and deny are not keywords for OPA. And so when that, when that microservice asks for the answer to a policy decision, it will ask for, let's say, allow. And so if you want to use allow and deny, you need to uh, write the logic that says how to resolve those conflicts to return a single value for allow. We've got an example of this later, so maybe that's the best way to, to, to illustrate that. Yes? Very good question. Give me 30 seconds. Uh, oh, sorry, the question was, are, is there anything like loops? Uh, and, 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 and then that's the answer. Okay, so here's a summary. I'm not going to bore you with the details. You can read this if you want. Um, all right, so now we're going to move on to the more interesting section, which is policies with iteration. All right, so we've talked about uh, dictionaries quite a bit. All the examples really have used mainly dictionaries, but what about arrays? Imagine we've got an array now that comes in as the input or as part of data, and now in order to make an authorization decision, I need to be able to find an element in that array. All right? Now, given what I've shown you so far, um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's really difficult to, to, to figure out how to write this, right? So imagine that we somehow, so here's, a, here's an array on the left-hand side in data. It's, it's a list of resources, each of which has an ID and an owner. Okay, and then the input that comes in is a user and a resource. And what we want to know and what we want to say is that this, this input is allowed exactly when that user is the owner of the resource that they are requesting access to. All right, and what that means is that we have to like, effectively iterate over the elements in that resources array to figure out if that user owns the resource that he is requesting. Now, imagine to start that we know magically that the... the that it's the first array element that we need to check, and it's only the first array element that we need to check, what would the logic be that we would write for this allow statement? Well, you see that on the right-hand side. What you see here is that allow is going to be true if the resource is at element zero. So if the input resource, the resource being requested, is the same as the resource ID at element zero in the data.resources array, and the input uh, and the user requesting the resource needs to be the same as the owner at the, f at the zeroth element of the data.resources array, right? So that's the logic that you would write if you knew that the, that the resource you cared about was at element zero of the array, all right? But we don't know it's at, zero, at element zero. It might be at element one, and so you could imagine repeating that allow statement um, if it was element one. All right, if, if the resource that you cared about was at element one. Now, uh, the obvious problem here is that we don't know which element uh, of the array we need to look at, and so that list of allow statements would actually be infinite. What OPA allows you to do, instead of writing an infinite policy, is to replace that, that index with a variable. Whoops. And so instead of writing that whole long list of allow statements, you can simply inject a variable into the array index. And now implicitly what this says is that allow is true if for some index the body of that statement is true. If for some index what I said earlier was true. All right? What, what OPA does when it sees a variable without a value is it implicitly, it automatically uh, does iteration. It automatically walks over all of the possible values for that index variable. And it, if it finds one where the that makes the body true, then it says the body as a whole is true, and it returns. Yes? Oh, the question is, is this autom automatic um, problematic if you make a mistake? OK, so. There, there are a lot of language constructs where if you'd use them accidentally, you would, th there, there would be a, a problem, yes. 
So yes, if you, accident, if you intended here to, uh, to assign index to a value and then you, you forgot to actually do that assignment, then yes. But this is how you can do iteration. You can do iteration, like conceptually what's happening here is uh, what OPA always does, and this is uh, universally the semantics, is that it finds an assignment, is that the, the, the head of a rule is true if there is some assignment to the variables in that body that make the body as a whole true. That's what it's always doing. That is its semantics. Question. Yeah, so the question is, instead of using a random variable name, what if you used underscore to, to, to ask for iteration? Uh, yeah, you're jumping ahead. I think there's, yes. You, so you can use the underscore. If you don't want to invent a new variable name, then you can use the underscore. Okay, qu questions here? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if you see the same variable in multiple places within a rule, it must be assigned the same value. Yes. Yes. But it goes to all the rules, for example, for one, or for zero index, and then it rates all the rules, so it's possibly. The question is if you had 100 of these allow rules, each of which has variables and require an iteration, does it run all, through all of the possible indexes for one rule and then go on to the next rule, or does it sort of interleave them? That's an implementation question. <laughs> no, but, but conceptually, you shouldn't have to care. One of the goals of OPA is to allow you to focus on the logic and the data and allow the performance uh, um, optimizations. Leave those to, leave those to OPA. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah, there's no way, sorry, the question is, uh, what happens if the data changes during evaluation? That can't happen. Yeah. Yes, there is. We've got a slide for that near the end. Um, it's a little tricky. You've got to use the old uh, trick back from, uh, when would we have learned this? Back from the, the old trick where if you want to do, uh, if you want to ask for everything, that's equivalent to saying, it's not the case that there exists one that's not true. Yes. Yes, and, and yes, you can do the full arbitrary quantifier alternation here. Yeah. So another good, uh, so the question was um, during evaluation if what happens once it finds a, an answer? And so again, that's a, that's a performance sort of optimization question. Uh, it's not a semantic question, right? So today, I th I th you know, one of the things on our list is to actually have it stop early once it's found an answer, um, but, but I don't think that happens today. There are other things that we've found in terms of performance that are more important than, than that one. Yes? Always. Oh, the question, uh, does rule evaluation have zero side effects? And I immediately said always, and that's ideally correct. There is that list of 40 um, of built-ins, uh, of operators, all of which today are uh, side effect free. We have talked to people who have embedded OPA as a library, and they added built-ins that do things in the world. And we j we've heard of that. I, again, that's not the intent of OPA. All side effects should have an outside by the service. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, question is, are there testing tools? Yes, unit, uh, OPA does have a unit test framework. And so you can write tests. I don't think I have any examples here. But you write tests in, literally in this rule language. Uh, and then there's a way to like mock out input. Yes. There's one more. How do you return data? So when, um, um, so when the service is asking for a policy decision, uh, that system can ask for, let's say, um, allow, in which case it gets true-false. Uh, there are other, as hopefully we'll see, there are, you can define virtual documents uh, where when the, 
when the outside service asks for the, the value of that document, it could be an array or a set or a, a dictionary or a number. OK, we should continue. All right, one important thing here is that despite the fact that I motivated iteration with arrays, you can use open to iterate over anything, right? So at the top here, we've got an example where we're iterating over both the array indexes and values. You can also iterate over dictionary keys and values. You, and it doesn't matter whether uh, you're iterating over the input uh, document or the data document. And then, uh, oh, we just left. And then here is your underscore. So if you don't want to bother inventing new variables all the time to do iteration, you can use an underscore. And unlike all the other variable names, you can use multiple underscores within a single rule. And those are all distinct variables. All right. Here's the observation. Uh, just because we're using iteration doesn't mean, how are we doing time? Doesn't mean that uh, we no longer have the problem of duplicated logic. Um, and so in this example, we've got logic duplicated that is actually searching for administrators uh, for who is an admin. Um, and so we want to avoid duplicating that logic here as well. Because iteration is special, um, or it, it, it requires some special constructs, we do have a, 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 a special constructs for, for eliminating duplicate logic inside of w when we have iteration. So in this example, we've pulled out that common logic. And we've created what we're calling a virtual document that defines a, a set, in this case, of administrators. And so this particular search that we factored out is, is iterating over all the users and finding all of those that are administrators. And then storing that result in what we're calling the admin variable. OK, so admin over here is the, the set Bob and Charlie. Um, and obviously, sets are an extension to JSON. When we render them and return them, uh, they look like arrays. Uh, there are different syntaxes for virtual sets. So here at the top is a rule syntax. And this is defining admin, again, as a set of all users that are admins. Uh, you can equivalently write that, that rule as uh, using set comprehension syntax. Um, and these two are entirely equivalent. The one on the bottom is something that, especially if you use, use Python, that is going to look really familiar. There is a slight dis distinction between these two syntaxes, though, which is that the rule syntax supports an or. So you could write multiple statements uh, that, all, uh, uh, that you union together to compute the, the admin set. Whereas the set comprehension syntax, you can't do that. All right. Likewise, in addition to, to building virtual documents that are sets or arrays, you can build a dictionary that's a virtual uh, that's virtual. Uh, and here again, it's pretty much the same thing. The only difference between this and the set is that uh, in the head of the rule here, instead of simply writing admin of user.name, we, we write an assignment that says admin of user.name equals user.department. Uh, and again, you've got a rule syntax for this for which you can, you can sort of uh, uh, write multiple copies of the, of the rule in order to create a union across all of those dictionaries. Uh, and then there's a dictionary comprehension syntax below, which is more familiar if you've used Python. Questions here? How are we doing on time? I got one minute? OK. Uh, well, OK. So let me see what else I should cover here. OK, let me f finish this. Um, so we've actually seen two cases where duplicated logic gets factored out, one of which is to use functions, the other of which is to use these virtual documents. So what are the trade-offs? The clear trade-off here is that uh, virtual documents support iteration. So if you define virtually a dictionary, you can use iteration just like I talked about earlier. You can iterate over the keys, over the values, over the keys and values. You can, you can fix the value and find all the keys that, 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 um, that are assigned to that value. With a function, on the other hand, it's like a function from a traditional programming language. And while you can, when you apply that function, like down here, if we want to look up Bob's department, we would write admin of Bob, just like you would expect. But what we can't do then is, is ask, give me, all of the, uh, give me all of the people whose department is HR. You just can't do that with a function. All right, so it may seem as though virtual docs support iteration, functions don't. And so therefore, virtual docs are completely superior to functions. Why use functions at all? Um, and the answer is, well, virtual documents must always be finite. 
Functions, on the other hand, can be infinitely large in the sense that, and, and, and for a long time, we, we just had virtual docs without any functions whatsoever. But then what we found time and time again is that we had stream manipulation that we needed to factor out. And stream manipulation, for example, the split path function on the right-hand side, um, is something that is infinite, right? You can hand it any string that you like, and it will actually uh, do the string manipulation and return a result. Hand it any URL, of which there are infinitely many, and then this function will, will parse that URL and return all of the segments in the path. All right, I think that's covered my minute. Uh, we've had lots of questions throughout, uh, so let's go ahead and wrap up. So there's another section here. I will post these slides online. Uh, and this is where you see how to uh, deal with modularity, multiple policies, and how you import one policy into another, and the like. All right, thank you all.